Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And I'm very excited about today's show because we're going to have a two-part visit with Nick DeVoe. Now, Nick is a guy whose dad was a pilot in World War II, and Nick wound up with his pilot logbook. Well, a few years ago, he discovered that there were other World War II vets out there who were very old and decided to start sending it around the world. And it's been traveling the world ever since for the last four or five years. And he's had it signed by somewhere around 113 people from all the different participating countries of World War II. Pilots and victims of different historical events. It's an amazing story. You're going to want to hear what got Nick going on this, some of the names, some of the stories in there, and what he's going to do with it. That's coming up in about 10 minutes or so. Hey, sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter today. You can do it for free at ExtremeGenes.com or on our Facebook. Facebook page. Get a blog from me each week, a couple of links to past and present shows, and links to stories that you'll appreciate as a genealogist. Right now, off to Boston, Massachusetts, David Allen Lambert is standing by, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. David, how are you? Hey, I'm doing really good, and also suffering from the hairs on the back of my neck still standing up after a discovery I found recently. Oh, now what, what did you find? Well, I was looking for my elusive grandfather, who, of course, has disappeared into thin air after 1953. This this was the criminal, right? The criminal. Uh, Yeah, this is my grandfather who liked to be behind bars and behind bars. Um, (laughs) This is what I was looking for. But then I found a front page article in November 1945 that mentioned my father in an auto accident. Now, The thing about this fish is I was a kid. My dad forewarned me that he was in a bad accident one time, but I never got a lot of the details about it, and I always thought it was in a neighboring town. Well, the article goes on to say that my father, who was 20 years old at the time, and is his cousin who just died, who was 16 at the time, were in an accident. The driver was thrown clear of the car, but the car crashed into a tree, split the tree in half. The car burst into flames. And if it wasn't for a nearby person in their house who saw the accident, who ran and pulled my father and the others out of the vehicle, I might not be having this conversation with you. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that would make your hair stand up a little bit. That was a close one, huh? Yeah, and I wanted to hopefully track down what happened to the veteran who pulled them out in November of 45, but he died a year after my dad did, but I'm still looking to pay respects at his grave, let alone track down his kids and say thank you. Wow, what a small world. Yeah, Yeah. really small world. Isn't that amazing? Genealogy never lacks the excitement and the new discoveries. And this kind of comes into the first story I want to mention, which is, of course, on ExtremeGenes.com. This is a story of Kathy Gilchrist, who got a surprise of her life when she found her biological dad. Now, that's not uncommon now because you're getting the DNA discoveries. When she had tested with 23andMe, and she found out that her father, William Bradford Bishop Jr., who was a highly educated former foreign service officer in the U.S. State Department, in 1976 killed his 68-year-old mother, 37-year-old wife, and three sons. He's one of the most wanted people by the FBI. Well, I've never heard a story quite like that. Wow. Well, it's not just a genealogist tracking down their dad. It's the FBI. Wonder who will find him first. <laughs> My bet is on the genealogist, actually. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Well, I want to tip my hat and wish a happy 114th birthday to America's oldest resident, and that is a Nebraska lady by the name of Thelma Sutcliffe of Omaha. She, on April 17th, after Hester Ford, who was 115, passed away, became the oldest person in America. She was born October 1st, 1906. That's crazy. (laughs) Happy birthday, Thelma. You know, I love when people are doing their genealogy and find an ancestor, then they just prove it and they 
find that they've lost that ancestor. Well, some people have found they had Viking DNA, and then their results now tell them they don't have Viking DNA. Well, this is a museum in Denmark that in 1868 required the remains of a Viking nobleman that had been dug up in a farm in all of the artifacts. Yeah, apparently they were mislabeled and put away safely in the museum for cold storage for a long time. They've just been found again. So <laughs> I hate it when they lose my ancestors like that. Right, right. Who knew? <laughs> do you have any Viking ancestors? Oh, I'm sure I do, but I mean, they're so far back, I don't know who they would be. I, I mean, I'm half Scandinavian. Yeah, that's true. I mean, so I guess it could have been anybody's ancestor because that grave dates back to 978. Yeah. Well, speaking of cemeteries, the city of Richmond, Virginia, just recently bought back a lot of land, 1.2 acres, known as the Shaco Hill African Burying Ground. It was last used in the 1870s, and it was a cemetery for free people of color. And this cemetery dates back at least 200 years. And if you look at the picture of it online from the Richmond Times Dispatch, there's an abandoned gas station with a lot of graffiti on it. And obviously, somewhere in there are the remains of probably hundreds of individuals. What a great story. Well, it's always nice when they can locate these cemeteries, and maybe there will be some preservation. At least start with maybe take down the gas station and put up a fence. You know, archaeologists recently doing some work in Israel found out that a fragment of pottery from 1450 B.C. supplies that missing link in the history of the alphabet. They know around 1800 B.C. in the Sinai Peninsula that the alphabet started to get developed and that it originally started to spread by 1300 B.C. into what became the Greek and Latin alphabets. Well, that's all I have from Beantown this week. So if you want to find out more about where I work, American Ancestors and AmericanAncestors.org welcome you to become a member. And if you do so and want to save $20, use the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David, thank you so much. We'll talk to you at the back end of the show for Ask Us Anything. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Nick DeVoe. He's a guy whose dad was a World War II pilot. He has the pilot book, and he's been doing some amazing things with it, you're going to want to hear all about it coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Anytime is a great time to learn more about your family. Did you miss Roots Tech Connect this year? It's not too late to experience Roots Tech classes, keynotes, and how-to content. Just visit RootsTech.org to see what you missed and to experience Roots Tech Connect on your own timetable. Select inspiring and insightful messages that will help you in your pursuit to connect with and share your family story in new ways. You can then use the free resources found at Family Service Search.org or the Family Search Family Tree app to have a deeper personal experience getting to know your family, past and present. Connecting with family and learning about your ancestors provides healing, peace, and a sense of belonging. And it's easy to share what you learn with others to help and inspire them as well. Visit RootsTech.org for some inspiration or visit FamilySearch.org to continue on your journey of family discovery today. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Well, genies, what a time we're all going through right now. And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. 
Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. So feel free to join us. The Facebook page, again, is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. Well, you know, we've been doing Extreme Genes for almost eight years now, and we're still having firsts. This is the first time I've actually ever interviewed somebody while they're on the beach, and it's the first time I've ever spoken to anybody in St. Lucia for their story, but that's the case with Nick DeVoe. Nick, welcome to Extreme Genes. Great to have you. Scott, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today. Well, I hope you stay nice and dry and don't sunburn as we chat here. (laughs) Under a shady tree. Very nice. Well (laughs) Well, Nick has come up with a great story and a great project based on his father's logbook as a pilot in World War II for the RAF and the RCAF, for the Canadians as well. Give us a little background on your dad, Nick. So my father was born in St. Lucia in 1920. So if he were still alive, he'd be 101. And when the war broke out here, St. Lucia being an English colony, basically all British citizens. And what's also very interesting at the time, and I'm only now realizing this, is that the Germans were actually in our waters in a big way with their U-boats. And so there was real threat, real present danger to these islands. In fact, one day a submarine came into our harbor and torpedoed two ships, right? Wow. Right across from where I'm sitting now, yeah. And people died and the whole bit. So the war very much was on the front lines here in these islands. And my father, of course, being from here, many people from here did their part, wanted to go and join up, most of them in the Merchant Marine. But my father decided he wanted to be a pilot and because, you know, that was a big draw, I think, for many young men at the time. So he was working in Trinidad, actually, hopped on a ship somewhere in the middle of 43, and got himself up into Canada, where there was a massive effort on to train pilots. Because, again, Canada also being a a British territory, they set up a massive air training program just to process pilots as quickly as possible into the war effort. And so he winds up over in England, yes, but no action. No action, because by the time, thankfully, by the time he qualified, which was in October 44, things were really starting to turn the way of the Allies, and war was really uh, in its closing stages. And by the time he then transfers over to England, it's late in the day. And in fact, the European theater closed up pretty soon after that. And then also, by then, there was this glut of pilots. He had the option to volunteer for a glider mission into either Germany or Holland. But that, if you know about the, you know, like the 8th Air Force and the casualty rates there, which yeah. was staggering, yes. the chances of surviving a glider mission were even more horrendous. So wisely, the old man opted out of that one. I'm truly grateful. Um, <laughs> when did he pass away? So he died in 1997. Gosh, how long ago is that now? That's yeah, like 24, 24 years. years. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah. So you've got yeah. his logbook now from the time he entered the service. And at right. what point did you decide, you know what, this is a piece of history and I want to make it even more of a piece of history? Right. So I had always had a fascination with World War II. Of course, my father, like many of his ilk, never really spoke about it. I knew one or two little things. In fact, I've probably told you everything I knew from his perspective. So I had this interest in World War II and I always knew about this book. And as a kid, even growing up, I kind of discovered it in my mom's dressing table drawer. I yank it out there one day, and I'm going through it. And he had a couple of photos in there. And again, not really appreciating what I was looking at. I yanked the pictures out, even damaged a couple of the pages. But the book was always there. It was always there. His writing is so impeccable in the book. It's, It's amazing. So he's got every single flight. It details everywhere he went, the planes he flew and all. And then I began to slowly appreciate what was really written in this document. But again, never really thinking that I was going to do anything with it. And then one day, there was a story that popped up on my news feed about a Japanese pilot. His name was Kaname Harada. 
And Mr. Harada was almost 100 years old, uh, still alive in Japan. And his story is just phenomenal. He he was at Pearl Harbor, although his, his job was just to stay with the carriers and defend them. Later on, he flew in about a midway. He was shot down, I think, somewhere in the Guadalcanal area. Uh, so he, this is a man who saw a lot of action and, and had a lot of kills as well. He was an accomplished pilot. And in later in life, after the war, he became a very outspoken peace advocate. He thought that you know violence and all the things that he had seen were just horrendous. He actually opened a kindergarten school. I've only discovered this recently, but he went to England. He met some of the pilots that he was in dogfights with. And so had a very high profile latter part of his life. And again, this story just popped up out of the blue. It's not that I was looking for it or anything. Sure. I suddenly, something just snapped inside of me and I thought, wow, how amazing would it be for this gentleman to sign my father's logbook? Of course, yeah, the enemy. Yeah, well, that, not just the quote unquote enemy, but just as an individual. Sure, you know, somebody you, who was part uh, of the history scene, yes. Of somebody who was there and what a rich history this man had. So you would think if somebody was going to do this, they would sort of maybe find, I don't know, a local veteran, somebody down the road. No, no, I had to <laughs> I, I had to find somebody on the other side of the world, speaks no English, I speak no Japanese clearly, and had no idea how to make this connection. And I mentioned to you earlier that I, I worked with the OECS, which is an international organization. And my boss at the time did it because Jules happened to be heading out to Japan on a business trip. And I had one associate in Japan, a gentleman that I had dealt with on a, on a separate matter, who was actually a New Zealander. So at least he spoke English. And I explained the whole crazy idea to him. I reached out to the reporter who had published the report, and we made contact, we made connection. And I got a sort of a green light to say that, yes, you know, he would be open to signing the book. So the day came, and this was all sort of, you know, you know how kind of, I don't know, when you, when you make plans, but you don't really think through the nitty gritty of the details. Well, the day finally came <laughs> to put this document in an envelope. And Scott, I was shivering. My hands were shaking. I mean, the enormity of what I was about to do hit me. Well, you were putting your dad's logbook at risk too, weren't you? You're sending it on the other side of the world. I mean, nuts, who does this? And I'm trying to stuff it in an envelope and the envelope was a little tight and it, it's not really going in. And I'm, my hands are shaking. I was a wreck. I was sweating. I'm the last of 10. I hadn't told any of my siblings about this. Ooh. Not that they were terribly concerned either. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mean, it was, the whole thing was not. Well, first of all, to try and get an agreement with 10 siblings, it's impossible anyway. So this was never going to happen. If I told any of them about it, they would have had yeah. me committed. <laughs> so, so I was like, you know what, I'm just doing this. So I stuff it in there. I get it in there. I address it. And I go down to my boss. And he's literally getting into a cab. And I'm like, here, you know, please mail this when you get there. When he understood what I was doing, he was even more horrified than me. And he's pushing it back in my eyes. Like, no, I'm not taking this. I said, no, you have to take it. And this kind of went back and forth. Eventually, I was like, look, take it. And off it went. And he went. And I didn't sleep very well for a couple of nights. I'll after bet. I yeah. Did, I did not. I, I was just like, my God, what have you done? My friend in Japan got the book a couple of days later. And that just was such a huge relief in itself. And I thought, wow, great. So then we tried to contact and really get to, okay, how do we send a book to Mr. Harada? And somewhere in the midst of that, they wrote back and said, you know, he's not doing so well. Try back in a couple of weeks. Well, in a couple of weeks, he passed away. Oh, no. Oh, yes. So this is out the blocks. You know, the book is in Japan. And I'm like, you have to be kidding me. But of course, he was 99. I was banking on him hitting the 100, you know. I was like, yeah, he's going to hold on. He's going he's gonna to make it. <laughs> and, you know, he passed away. So at that point, I was like, wow, okay, now what? Yeah, but do you get the and, book back or what, what happened? Yeah, so I was like, well, I was real let down, you know, and I was like, wow. And then somehow President Obama was in Japan around the time and made a speech in his official capacity as a United States president at the Hiroshima Memorial. And it's the only time a U.S. president has done that. And at that speech was a gentleman who had survived the atomic bombing. His name was Shigiaki Mori. There's a photograph of President Obama in a big embrace with Mr. Mori. And I thought, huh, OK, what's the story here? So I start to read, and Mr. Mori was about 10 years old on a bridge headed to school on August 6, 1945, in Hiroshima. The bomb falls, and he gets blown off the bridge, falls into the river, and that's how he survived the heat blast. Climbs up out of that into, you know, this Armageddon. 
survives that whole horrendous story. And I don't know a lot about those details, but he did manage to survive. Wow. And subsequently grows up. But that's only the entry part of this story. Mr. Mori is a very avid historian. And before the bomb, his father was a policeman. And from his school, he could see that there were some U.S. servicemen who'd been shot down or were being kept captive at the police station where his father worked. And he could see these men, not many of them, I think it was about four or five of them, but he could see them and he knew very well that they were U.S. POWs. Of course, they all died in the bomb. Years later, they built the memorial and they put the names of all the victims, all the deceased Japanese people who died in Hiroshima are on this memorial. Shigeaki Mori, seeing this, felt that these U.S. servicemen, the names of these men deserve to be in that memorial. So somewhere, I think this is in the 70s or maybe in the 80s, this Japanese man who speaks no English, without the help of the internet, this information became declassified because, of course, immediately after the war, this was not spoken about. Nobody in the U.S. wanted anybody to know that they had killed their own people in the bombing. So this was sensitive information, but it subsequently became declassified. And Mr. Mori got this information, got the names. He went to the library, got some phone books, and begins to call people in the U.S. to try and track down their families. This man speaks no English. I'm not sure exactly how long it took him, but he eventually connected every single one of those men to their families in the U.S. Wow. There is a documentary called Paper Lanterns, produced by a man named Barry Freshett, which tells this story. And subsequently, Mr. Mori was able to get the names of these U.S. servicemen on that memorial in Hiroshima. All right, we're going to take a break for a minute here, Nick. Your story's incredible, and listen to these people he's writing to to get to sign his logbook from his father's days as a pilot in World War II. We're going to come back. We're going to hear more about Nick's incredible project from the beach in St. Lucia when we return <laughs> in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. We're back on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, talking to Nick DeVoe from a beach in St. Lucia right now, talking <laughs> to about his logbook project. It's the logbook of his father, who was a fighter pilot for the Brits during World War II, Cyril DeVoe. And uh, he's been sending it around the world, having people connected to World War II autograph this book they're getting up there in age now nick and you were just telling me about the young man who somehow survived the hiroshima blast in 1945 and then went on to get the american pow's who were killed in the blast added to the memorial there so how did you get him to sign your dad's raf logbook right so as i mentioned scott the book was already in japan with mr harada having passed away the initial uh, intended recipient and signatory who never signed. But then I discovered this thing with Mr. Mori, with President Obama at this official ceremony where Obama made a speech at the Hiroshima Memorial. There's a photograph of President Obama hugging Mr. Mori, and we then reached out. Normally, I find people through the articles, through the reporters who write about them. So we must have done that, although I honestly don't remember, but we did make contact. And then Mr. Mori's response was, yes, I'll sign it, but I'm not very well. I have to go to the hospital. And based on the heels of the immediate predecessor, you know, gentleman who passed away, I thought, oh, oh this is becoming a kiss of death. <laughs> but thankfully, he recovered. And as I subsequently understand now, his hospital visits are regular because he deals with the legacy of the radiation poisoning. And of course. He suffers with cancer. Yeah. So anyway, he came out of the hospital and he signed the book. Book went to him and, and then my buddy over there sent me a photograph and two simple words, Shigiaki Mori. That was it. There was no Japanese. There was no date. There was nothing. That was all he wrote. And when I saw that, it was like the curtains lifted and I realized, wow, how many other amazing stories are on this planet? That was five years ago. And I can tell you today we're at 113 signatures. Oh, my gosh. Um, wow. And uh, how many different yeah. countries are represented in those signatures, Nick? At least seven or eight. Canada through the Caribbean, Europe, Holland, Germany, England, the United States, back and forth. 
there are two loose pages from the book that sort of come loose at the bindings. One of those currently right now is in India, the subcontinent. It's been to Australia, New Zealand, of course, Japan. Been to Japan three times. Really? Uh, right now it's in the U.S. In a few days, hopefully, 101-year-old Marth Kahn, who was a Jewish spy. Oh, wow. Uh, grew up in France. Yeah. She lives out in California. Just today, I received confirmation that she is willing and happy to sign the book. Her husband is a gentleman named Major Khan, who also served in the Navy during the war. So they will do a, a couple signing, which would be amazing. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had the likes of Mr. Gail Halverson. He's the candy bomber, who you may have, yes. may have heard his story. I've had him on Extreme Jeans before. Oh, lovely. What a wonderful gentleman yes. he is. So gracious. I had Mr. Bud Anderson, who is the most prolific U.S. living ace still alive in the United States signed just after Mr. Halverson. So the stories go on and on. Just amazing people. But I also have people who not necessarily involved in the war, but just witnessed incredible things. You know, people that survived through the Battle of Britain. Obviously, experiences that will never hopefully happen again and, sure. and will be gone once they all pass away. And you're right. I started this project much too late. There have been a few instances of persons who've said, yes, they're happy to sign and then passed away. Jerry Yellen, he served in the very last air combat mission of World War II in Japan. Wrote me back a lovely email saying, yes, I'd be happy to sign and I'll even send you. He'd written a few books and so on and unfortunately passed away subsequently before I could get the book to him. So the heartbreaks that are part of the reality of this journey. Sure. Well. So, Nick, what are some of the interesting things that some of these people have written in your dad's pilot logbook? You know, I had a neighbor. This woman is from Poland. This woman grew up with and her husband was an operative dropping in behind enemy lines. He was picked up by the Gestapo and tortured. I think her brother was killed. I had no knowledge of this. These people, they almost raised me so close to my parents. I didn't even understand this. So when I subsequently found out really what the history was, she's now in a retirement home in England. But I wrote to her and she wrote, you know, she, there was a woman who signed just before her, a German lady, who was at one of those terrible carpet bombings that the Allies did to the Germans towards the end of the war. Cologne. And I have people who survived Dresden as well. Unreal. But this woman experienced that similar type of firebombing and the tornadoes and the whole bit. And then the book went to this other lady that I'm mentioning to you. But she just wrote, oh, that was just one experience. I survived days on end of bombs that fell in the area where she was. So it was just interesting how people compare and contrast. Of course, these stories are equally horrific to me. But when you really sit and you go through the experiences from these people's perspective, it's a very interesting thing to get that real personal emotional experience. Yeah. So are you going to take like photocopies of these signatures and then write up their that's stories exactly next to them? Yes. So that's exactly what we are doing. We have a, a website, the logbookproject.com. A gentleman out of Sweden has helped me tremendously. He just contacted me last year and he said, listen, what you're doing is amazing. How can I help? Lars went and built out this website. It's the most amazing thing. And we are now able to have the profiles, put the stories up. And he's also doing other graphics and shows, you know, where the book has gone. And then the backstories, the related stories, stories of people who either assist or some of the crazy connections. For instance, going back to Mr. Mori, Mr. Mori survived the atom bomb. Well, on the Indianapolis, the story of them carrying parts of the bomb to Ulithi and then being torpedoed and then spending three and a half days in the water. I have one gentleman of the Indianapolis, Mr. Edgar Harrell, who signed the book. And so you begin to understand some of these crazy connections. Yes, not directly, but just it, it's a mind blow in that sense that, you know, here's one individual who contributed or was part of this. And here's another individual who was affected by and and there's quite a number of those. And so we're beginning to piece some of those crazy connections together, even between some of the signatories, which is fascinating to me. Absolutely. I, I totally get it. So obviously we're going to run out of World War II people here really, really soon. And you're obviously already experiencing a lot of that, people who pass away before they get the chance to sign it. So there is yeah. a finish line to this at some point. What are you going to do with the logbook when this is all finished? 
Yeah, the actual repository for the logbook is still very much up in the air. I mean, on one hand, it's just a dusty old logbook from my father, and there are thousands of them out there in the planet. And my father never really went on any exotic missions or anything like that. So in that sense, it's very ordinary. There's nothing really special about it. On the other hand, people are terrified to touch it now. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, we've informally started something called the Hue Club. And that's the reaction that people have. They'll go, okay, yes, I'll receive it. And my father, my mother will sign it. And then they get rid of it. And it's just like, phew. And they wrap it up like a bomb and off it goes. And it is insane. And I could vanish at any moment. But the experiences that I have had, the people that I've met, my whole appreciation for life in general, you know, I'll never be the same person again. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. But as to what to actually do with this book, maybe you have it traveling around from place to place. Because if it sits in a corner collecting dust, it's not doing anything. So it's really the vibrancy of the stories and getting those out. That, to me, is more important. And through the website, I think that's where our primary focus will be. But I would like to make the book available to museums and other institutions out there that still celebrate anniversaries of different things during the war. He's Nick DeVoe. He's on a beach in St. Lucia and it's <laughs> sharing these amazing stories. Nick, thanks so much for your time. Good luck to you in the future with all this, and we look forward to uh, seeing what comes of it down the line. Scott, I really want to thank you for your time. It's networking like this that helps get the stories out. So this is so tremendous of you. Thank you, and I wish you all the success in the world with what you are doing. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert returns from AmericanAncestors.org as we do another round of Ask Us Anything, answering your questions on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, when we return in three minutes. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process, and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Well, genies, what a time we're all going through right now. And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. So feel free to join us. The Facebook page, again, is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. Anytime is a great time to learn more about your family. Did you miss Roots Tech Connect this year? It's not too late to experience Roots Tech classes, keynotes, and how-to content. Just visit RootsTech.org to see what you missed and to experience Roots Tech Connect on your own timetable. Select inspiring and insightful messages that will help you in your pursuit to connect with and share your family story in new ways. You can then use the free resources found at FamilySearch.org or the Family Search Family Tree app to have a deeper personal experience getting to know your family, past and present. Connecting with family and learning about your ancestors provides healing, peace, and a sense of belonging. And it's easy to share what you learn with others to help and inspire them as well. 
Visit RootsTech.org for some inspiration or visit FamilySearch.org to continue on your journey of family discovery today. All right, it's time once again for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. David Allen Lambert is back, and uh, Dave, we have a great question here from Joe Miller in Sunset Beach, North Carolina. And he says, guys, how common is it for passengers to not be on a ship's passenger list in the 19th century? An interesting question. I'll, I'll get your take first, Dave. Well, you know, there's many factors to consider. I mean, one obviously is that they could have stowed away, which is probably very slim on the line yeah. of possibility. Otherwise, um, names could be misspelled completely. Yeah. They may have chosen a different name when they emigrated. Generally speaking, though, a passenger list is usually created at the point of the departure. The big myth that you've probably had many people ask you over the years, I get all the time, what names were changed at Ellis Island? So <laughs> the name wasn't changed when you got here because that list was created when they left. So the name being changed may have been at the point of origin. The other thing is 1820 is a real pinnacle year. That's when the federal government started recording passenger lists. So not knowing when in the 19th century they're looking for fish, if it's between, say, 1801 and 1820, it's possible they just may have not been illicit survived. Absolutely. There can be water damage. There can be misinterpretations of the handwriting when it comes to uh, all kinds of things. I am missing an entire family of my second greats, my second great grandfather, my second great grandmother and their kids. And another second great grandfather, I think it's his right name. It's fairly common, but it matches the month and year that I thought it should be. But mm -hmm. there's no wife, there are no kids, and I don't know where they are either. So it's also right. possible, too, that they wound up coming into a different port than you were expecting, and maybe you'd find them elsewhere. Well, and that's true. In Massachusetts, most people are obviously coming into Boston, but we have the port of New Bedford, Newburyport. Well, a lot of these early customs house records, they're not well kept. And I know people that I've seen naturalizations for it said, I arrived in this port on this date, and it's not a major port. Then you go to try to find passenger arrivals for that port, and there isn't anything. Yeah. So it could be part of that reason, too. I'd be curious to see where the naturalization is pointing for their arrival port. And the challenge is also to figure out where they left from. Are their records left back in the old country? That's very true. And like for most people that were coming out of England in the 19th century, those records really don't start to begin until the 1860s. Yeah. Uh, so you're not getting a lot of the earlier ones. And then, you know, people are always looking for their ancestors between 1620 and 1820. And for the most part, there's not a lot of ship manifests when you get into the 18th century that survive of any great magnitude. Mm -hmm. The best place to find those are, for instance, just as a side note, are in newspapers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, and you've got to consider, too, that there are probably still a lot of these smaller ports where the information on the passenger list have not been indexed or digitized yet. That's true. And, you know, there's got to be well, a lot we, more out there. Well, I can tell you that Family Search and Ancestry and groups like that have been working actively to try to find all of that type of American immigration records over the years. But there's always room for one more attic and one more public building that, oh, look what we found here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a great challenge, and we wish you the best of luck, Joe. We appreciate the question, and I do struggle with that. I'm looking for those names all the time, and I just scratch my head as to why in the 1830s and 40s, coming into New York, I cannot find these people I'm looking for. So how about you, Dave? Um, I have some ancestors that I know should have been on a passenger list that I haven't quite found yet. Or if they come over as a chain migration that the father comes over and the family is supposed to follow them soon after. When did the family come over? They show up on the census, but I don't find them arriving. So I guess the answer would be yes, it's common. So thanks so much for that. we got another question with Ask Us Anything coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Oh, 
All right, back for part two of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher at this end with David Allen Lambert from AmericanAncestors.org. David, our second question today comes from Rick Lane in Farmington, Connecticut. And he says, guys, I have a first great grandfather who had a business in upstate New York in the late 1800s. How would I research that business? I can tell you there's lots of different angles that you can research a business. I mean, obviously, so many newspapers that are online looking for an ad the newspaper may have carried for your ancestor. Or better yet, the most popular thing for people, especially if it's an urban-related business, city directories. I mean, in Boston has them back to 1789, so I've been able to use that to track down some of my 19th century ancestors' business, the different addresses they had. And, of course, one of the fun things to do with that is to plug in the address and see what's there now. That's right. It's kind of funny to see if it's still the same business or that type of business. I had one relative, my third great grandfather, Henry Poor in Newburyport, had a mercantile business with someone. Their store was around for about three years until you see in the newspaper the dissolution of this partnership has ended, all stock and bills owed to us, blah, blah, blah. You know, it has all this great detail about the business closing and what the final sale of items would be. But I did a little work on it because it mentioned it was on a wharf. Well, that wharf is now filled in land. But I know the road, and it's now where the Newburyport Art Association is, and it's an huh. 18th century brick building, and it's still standing, and I was able to get a tour of it inside and out, including a little room that had a fireplace upstairs, and I said, that's probably where he sat and had his porridge at night. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right about that. I think it's great fun. I had a great-grandfather who had a business in New York City in the late 19th century, and I found a lot of stuff in newspapers and, as you mentioned, Dave, directories. If you could make a timeline following through the directories when it started and then look for changes, say, in partnerships. We had some fires in his business, so there were the stories of the fires and how it burned the place down and the, how they had to rebuild. And mm -hmm. also, by the way, there is a, a great source at Harvard University at their Baker Library there. It's the R.G. Dunn and Collection Reports. And they go through and actually analyze the viability of all these businesses. And I was actually able to find an account of my great-grandfather's business there, starting in 1855 and going all the way through to 1883. And there are mentions of my great-grandfather, his two brothers who were involved in the business, how they did business, where they were located. It was really great stuff, and I was really surprised how much could be found there. You know, it's really amazing what's actually out there as more and more things get digitized. And of course, you want to check with local historical societies and see if they have actual account books or business papers. And sometimes tracking down the descendants of your ancestor that are not specifically your line. Maybe a cousin Mabel out in Tacoma has a pile of papers that, oh, yeah, those are our great-grandfather's business records. Would you like them? You never know what you're going to find. Well, and it's funny you mention that because in 2014, I inherited a bunch of stuff from a third cousin. And among the items that he had was the business agreement from 1888 between my great-grandfather and his brother talking about their partnership. And it's like five pages of agreement, and both of them signed it at the end. I was absolutely amazed. So you never know what you can find out there that uh, relates to the family and the business, but there's a lot to be found without getting into business records. That really is. Well, good luck to them. I hope that they find everything they hope for, and maybe there's some story for extreme genes down the road. Could be. Thanks so much, Rick, for the question. And, of course, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can always email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. David, thanks so much. Always great to talk to you, my friend. Same here, my friend. And that is our show for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks once again to Nick DeVoe for coming on and talking about his dad's World War II pilot book and what he has been doing with it. An absolutely incredible story. If you missed any of it or you want to catch it again, listen to the podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, Spotify, or TuneIn Radio. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 